Hi, this is Deborah Holchin, editor of Michigan Today. In this episode of Listen in Michigan, my guest is poet Keith Taylor, the recently retired A.L. Becker Collegiate Lecturer in English and Creative Writing. He's also director of the Bear River Writers Conference, an annual haven for creative wordsmiths to gather in the wilds of northern Michigan and vibe off of nature. Taylor is a native of British Columbia, and he's written or edited 13 books. His works appeared in journals, magazines, anthologies, and newspapers all throughout the U.S. and Europe. He's received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and support from the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs. He's a bit of a world traveler and collector of experiences that inform his writing, from washing dishes in southern France to painting houses in Ireland to being a night attendant at a pinball arcade in California. But since settling in Ann Arbor many years ago, selling books at Shame and Drum, he has discovered the delights of writing about home. An avid birder who once fancied a career in the sciences, he's been able to share his love of nature through his writing. He, like most of us, shares an affinity for northern Michigan with the late Ernest Hemingway and often teaches writing to non-writers and scientists who are studying at U of M's biological station. It's close to so many of Hemingway's favorite places. Keith's latest book, Ecstatic Destinations, spotlights Ann Arbor with poems written about a specific triangle of land on the city's west side. Readers will recognize the sights and sounds of their beloved college town, whether it's the wail of a far-off train whistle or the discovery of used condoms on a bench in Veterans Park. An experience that Taylor artfully takes from ew to oh, (laughs) seriously, he does it. The man's an artist. Anyway, among my favorites are his poems about the trees of Michigan. So let's listen in as Keith reads an ode to some hickory trees and explains how our town inspired his latest collection. Here's Keith. Evening, late October. Last to turn, hickories, yellow to terracotta, even close to dark, are illuminated like holy women in Rembrandt from within. Gorgeous. Thank you. I really did travel a lot, and I traveled a lot before I got to Ann Arbor, and even though I was broke for most of the first 20 years I was here, but I still managed to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like to travel. I like to explore new places. I've written about new places, but it's a very different experience about writing about a new place and writing about a place you know very, very well. uh, So so there is that sense of discovery, which I hope is in some of my poems. that, that, you know, you see something and isn't that kind of special. But then there's that other sense of, okay, I'm not going to discover things here, but do other people see these things as clearly as I do? Well, you know, you describe this as a happy little book. Um, yeah. So uh, do you have some favorites in here? I know oh, I've got couple. lots of, I've got lots of favorites in here. Um, <laughs> so do I. L- let's see. Um, if you ever drive out, drive out Dexter about a block up on the right-hand side, You'll see oh, yeah. this incredible garden. It's a whole front lot yard of mm-hmm. house. And there and I live straight right across the street. So uh, for years I've had this incredible gift of watching that. And and once the flowers have bloomed for the first time, Fred and Anne lean over and they take off the dead heads so mm-hmm. they get another blossom. And when they, they're bending down, it reminded me of Millet's like famous painting, The Gleaners, uh-huh. where the poor people are down in the thing. And then of course the, 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 the grandfather Michigan poet of us all, Theodore Retke, wrote about the greenhouses in, in Saginaw. So, um, so all of those things were in my mind when I, and I had to write a poem for the 2018 Retke Memorial Calendar. Oh. So I called it the Gleaners after Retke and Mie. For 30 years I've watched them stoop, Fred and Anne, waist deep in green, deadheading flowers after their first blooming. No wheat fields cleaned by hand this time, but the garden across Dexter Ave prepared at the cusp of summer for its next extravagance. They clipped the plants below their seed pods, forcing a generosity of display that stops me for the pleasure and perfume of it all season long. And that's the thing that hit me. When somebody does a garden like that, and we have a, we have a garden, and my wife works very, very hard at it, I help some um not enough and but but that like a garden like that right in the front on the street on a very busy street consciously or not that's a gift to the rest of us you know i mean that is generosity Mm -hmm. i mean that's a lot of work 
the, the triangle of streets I talk about is uh, down Dexter Avenue to North Maple, where Vets Park is, across North Maple, so the park is all mm -hmm. off to the east, and back on Jackson. It's a mile and a half triangle. It's my exercise. It's not by far the, the prettiest neighborhood. I was kind of surprised uh, when I saw that yeah, was and, what and, your location and, and, was. Right, and Vets Park is certainly not the prettiest park. And if I wanted the prettiest park, I'd write about the arm, yeah, you know, but yeah. I'm, I'm not writing about okay. the arm. I'm writing about that sports park out on the west side of town. Um, but there are things there that I see, and I see only because I've seen them over and over and over again. Well, let me, let me read the uh, skateboard poem. Oh, yeah, that's a good um, one. So this is the first one of these I wrote of the series. This is the one that gave me the idea for the book. So, the skateboard park seen from afar. Down past empty baseball diamonds, the skateboarders glide silently through air, their gossamer wings invisible. Their wheels grinding against the ramp, the crack of the boards when they pop upward into flight, it has all dissipated in the space between us. Even their mistakes are angelic. So I'm doing my little mile and a half walk just to make sure I get outdoors because I'd probably rather stay in my study and read. <laughs> um, and, I'm, I, and I'm looking at these skateboarders and it just dawned on me, they're so graceful. And they probably don't even know they're graceful, you know? So, and then I walked around and I walked over by the ice rink and I'm on a little bench up there and I'm looking down and from far away, can't hear the noise, can't even see the skateboards. And, and it's like, oh, and it looks like they're flying. They're sort of zooming along the ground. Um, and it's like, well, they're angels. And they have no idea they're angels. So that's where the poem came. And then there was that poem about the condoms, which came right after. And <laughs> maybe, suddenly I realized. Maybe you should read that one. <laughs> you want to read that? Okay. Sure. It's, uh, I mean, this is the one I can't read on the radio because <laughs> it has a bad word. But I can, <laughs> I can read it on a, on a podcast. Sure, we'll okay. see what happens. Um, so let's, let's turn it into something other than disgusting, which is our first all, all of us is our first response. Oh, and this is, you can also see from that title, Skateboard Park, Seen From Afar, Condoms, comma, Abandoned on the Park Bench. And I had those titles. I said, oh, those like, sound like the titles of paintings. Oh, they do, um, yeah. And then I had, you know, then the other one came with the gleaners. Then I was thinking of those French painters, and they all were always outside, en plein air. Uh-huh. And, and I was thinking, I'm going to write all these poems outdoors in this endless triangle area. And I did, I, I did most of the work on this book outdoors. So this was the second poem I did, and this is the last poem. And when I wrote the last line, I knew I had the title for the book. Condoms abandoned on the park bench. I prefer to imagine the fucking here last night was fantastic. A perfect diamond to hold in memory as their world turns bleak. That night, last night, just a bit too cool to be naked outdoors when they threw their heads back and whispered to the stars, while below them, the cars on North Maple sped off to ecstatic destinations. Love <laughs> okay. it. Yeah, good. And, and it's, I mean, I really, you know, as the book came together and as, you know, and then when, when the publisher um, put this together and to see the title and then to get to that mm -hmm. right at the end, um, it just felt right. It's it's very right. cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you've got stuff about the deer call. It's interesting. I do, yeah. the deer call. You know, I mean, there, there, is, there is Ann Arbor in here um, <laughs> and the sound of the train. If you, don't, if you live in town close enough to hear the train mm -hmm. going, going through town in the early morning. Oh, I love that line that the railroad tracks might actually lead somewhere. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, let's do that a little bit. I've never, okay. I don't know that I've actually read that poem. Okay. In the, let's see, it's toward the end, right? Yeah, the next day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as an old man now, you know, I get up in the, many times in the night, and sometimes I fall back to sleep, and sometimes I don't. So I sit in my study, leave the lights off, and listen to the train uh, a mile away. The next day, up at 4 a.m. again, and a mile away, the train moves through our city, blowing its desperate whistle, as if railroad tracks might actually lead someplace, or someone waits to offload cars of grain or oil for his startling tomorrow. Love it. Startling tomorrow. I was just listening to a, one of my favorite podcasts, and Bob Newhart was the guest. Uh, he feels if you can make people laugh, like if you're a comedian and you can make people laugh, you have an obligation to do so. Wow. So it sounds like something I heard about you. You write poetry as a demand of gods in whom you don't really believe. Right. Demand of the gods in whom I don't believe. Yeah. Um, I've never liked the word career attached to the arts. It feels far too chosen, 
Um, and, and, and yes, I mean, I'm, you know, enough of a person of my, my time, the late 60s and early 70s. It, it feels uh, ambitious, not in the good way. It feels almost greedy. Okay. And I've never felt that my writing is a career. Um, there might be people who would say, yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, it, it has felt to me from the very beginning as if it were something I had to do, as if, as if I were chosen. And there, I've had enough experiences. I mean, you work, and you you know you spend a lifetime getting the education, and um, and you make the choices that you know are learned choices. Every now and then, you get the feeling that this is all a gift. This comes to me for. It's not me. I'm not that smart. My ears not that good. Um, who you know? Where is that coming from? Um, and um, and it's a that's a kind, that's a kind of wonderful feeling. And. It's something I do because I really don't have a choice. It gets can get so romantic. Once you start doing this as a young person, and then you don't stop, and then you start trying to publish and get an audience or get, get it out there in the world, um, at some point, you can't stop. I mean, there's, you don't have that choice anymore. It's you just keep, because this is who you are to yourself. Once I ran a photo essay about the um, biological station, and there was a great shot of you really? with your class on like a big punching. <laughs> oh, yeah, type you've seen rap. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so it, cute. It, like, it, it was. It was, po it was posed, but, but yeah. <laughs> so it's you a, didn't teach out there the whole I hour? I did not. No, no. Um, <laughs> just such a great idea. So, yeah. what is it about teaching up there that you love? You well, know? I, it's, you know, I get to be in that place. Um, Talk and, a bit about that place. I've never been there. Oh, you've never been no. there? Oh, you got to go. You got to visit. <laughs> Talk, tell it, describe it to the other people who are <laughs> The have university been there. has own 10,000 acres on Douglas Lake up in Emmett County, about 20 miles south of the bridge. The university has owned that since 1909. And they got it cheap because the land had been devastated, logged yeah. and burned and nothing there. And what we've done for well over a century is essentially watch the forest regrow. Mm -hmm. And we've and we've done a lot of experiments on that yep. and lots you know they, and, 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 yeah, and it's lots of burns and 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 things have and things have changed but really that's what's been going on. It's been we've been watching and studying the regrowth of the forest and of course now since everybody wants to study carbon retention what you know how much carbon is retained mm -hmm. when those as those trees get bigger what happens when those trees die um, you know that that whole those whole series of questions which are really really pretty fascinating. So there's a lot of people doing research sometimes more than there are students and uh, you know it's really great for students to be in that whole mix mm -hmm. and then I've always been interested in the literature of Michigan um, since I realized I was going to live here and marry a woman from Michigan so I started looking for that stuff and a lot of that is northern stuff mm -hmm. of course there's the great Hemingway early Hemingway stories mm -hmm. I can teach that up there teach those Hemingway stories yeah. and take them and show them the places we can go to Horton Bay on Lake Charlevoix uh, read the stories yeah. aloud and realize that Hemingway was remembering like one square meter of land the, what he's describing in Paris you know when he's writing in a bar in Paris you can only see within like a, you know size of a, a tabletop yeah um, and and, and so that's real interesting. And, of course, we haven't messed it up. I mean, Hemingway places in Havana and Key West are, like, atrocious yeah. tourist traps. Yeah. And northern Michigan was much more important to Hemingway and, and to his fiction than Havana or Key West was. But nobody's ever there. Wow. There was one year we sat on the dock in Horton Bay, read a short story, Hemingway's first surviving short story, um, called Up in Michigan, uh, and then the Nick Adams story that take place right on that bay. And as we left, somebody was listening to radio, and, and they said, it's Hemingway's birthday. And there was nobody there while we were there. We were completely alone, wow. reading these stories in this place that he remembered so vividly. And on his birthday, and there was nobody there yeah. with us, uh, which was amazing. <laughs> I was just at Walden Pond recently. Oh, really? That's quite a place, that isn't it? That was yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah I, was, was I was there a few years ago. Yeah. So lovely and going to Emerson's house yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. In this world of digital media, yet another interesting thing I read about you, like just the, the concept of when we're searching for something on the internet, we're searching for something specific. It, it eliminates the possibility of like a natural discovery. Wow, I don't know that I'd said that in public before. Serendipitous so, yes. discovery. Why yeah. did I say that? That's I don't know. Uh, it might yeah. have been in your exit interview that you did. Oh yeah, uh, no, that's on. That's there's a there's a film of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, I mean that that's important to me, and and there are some you know information architects who are actually thinking about that. Mm -hmm. That and this is why I think I loved working in bookstores too. Libraries were always a good place and still are a good place to find things you're looking for. But you could still just sit down on the floor and find things you weren't planning on finding. But you went there. The internet, 
you you know there are parameters to the searches. And now, of course, with all these algorithms they're using to pigeonhole this. And are you going to find something that you don't plan to find? I mean, I don't know. Bookstores were always great for that. My big one on that, by the way, I'll tell you this little story. Do we? I don't know. Are we going to run out of time? No, we have all the time in the okay. world. Okay. Uh, um, I managed Shaman Drum Bookshop up here on State Street, um, just a couple blocks from here, for the 90s. The guy who owned that store, a wonderful guy, left us far too far too young. His name was Carl Port. He would go, I mean, this was a tough way to make a living. Totally independent, trying to have books and scholarly books on the humanities and make a living off that. There, around the university, there are lots of academic journals that are, that are housed in basements all around. I mean, there, there are a bunch of them. I, I, I don't have no idea how many. And this, those magazines, those journals are always sent books to review. And they're sent a lot of books to review, often very obscure books that no one's going to have a review of, no one's going to read. And Carl, because he would try to have these books outside the bookstore, would go and buy these things and pay them like a nickel apiece. And we'd, sell, we'd put a $2 price on there. And, and then it gets stolen, they get snowed on. And, <laughs> and they were really obscure. And we'd often laugh at the obscurity of the titles. At one point, we had a gigantic book. We had three copies of a gigantic book, which was all the Latin names for the insects of Missouri. <laughs> And there wasn't, I need to have that. Yeah, well, that's all, you know, and that's all it was. Um, and so we were doing one, right? right, and we put them all out at art fair, too, of course. Um, so we were, we, were, we were looking through boxes of books Carl had bought, and he pulled out one towel, and he laughed. And I'm, I'm from Western Canada. Did I say that already? Mm-hmm. I'm from Western Canada originally. So he pulled out this book, and he said, and he laughed, and he threw it across the table. And he said, no one in three states would buy that except you. And, and the title of the book was Pioneer Policing in Southern Alberta, Dean of the Mounties, 1880 to 1914. And this is on sale in Ann Arbor, Michigan, <laughs> um, on a hot July day. And I looked at this, now, Carl, even I'm not going to, to buy this book. Oh. So I would put a price on it. I was going to take it outside, put it on the tables for art fair. I said, well, I've got to look up my hometown. There was one reference to my hometown, so I went to it. As I was reading this reference, what I discovered I was reading was the police report of my Irish immigrant great-grandmother's suicide. And it ended with the transcription of her suicide note addressed to her four older children, one of whom was my grandfather. And no one alive knew that she'd done this. Whoa. They'd been deeply ashamed in, in my grandparents' generation. In 1907, um, and it's the, the, the suicide Holy note smoke. starts out, um, your father told me to leave the place this morning if I would not sleep with him. I love my children. God knows I love my children. I don't want any more children. And she went out to the outhouse and drank a jar of acid. Oh, my God. Um, and I, I was reading this, in, and I'm good. If, if, you know, if you keeled over right now, I, I, I'd respond well. You know, I, I'd run on the hall and scream <laughs> and then come back and, you know, give you CPR or something. Um, but I almost fainted when I realized what I, I was reading. I cannot believe you know? that. And art fair is going on outside, and it's 100 degrees, and, you know, and it's like, and I'm back in Alberta in 1907 with my desperately poor Irish relatives. And uh, um, so that kind of serendipity. Now, if I'd looked for that online, I wouldn't find it. So I did a bunch of work on this, and that's one of the reasons I had to retire, because I'm, I do. I wrote an essay about finding it. It's going to be reprinted in a book that Wayne State is, University Press is publishing, um, in the, really in the next month or two, a uh, book of, of essays by Michigan writers. Uh, but I do want to write a whole sort of book because I did a lot of work on her. I, you know, so it's been, uh, for 20 years, I've been trying to deal with this story that came to me serendipitously. That is um, fascinating. But, and that's, I feel an obligation mm-hmm. to that story. Um, not just because it's clearly um, a, a story of, of women's reproductive rights, yeah. um, but, you know, it's, it's my story. Yeah. This woman is an essential part of my gene pool. Um, so serendipity, yeah, that, that one hopes that serendipity is not going to be lost in the digital age. Um, but but there, are, there are really smart people who are thinking about that now. There's a, yeah. there's a guy in Ann Arbor named Peter Morville who's successful and actually quite famous information architect in that world. And he's thinking about that now. He's thinking about serendipity and yeah. what it means and can we build serendipity into the system and, yeah. wow so, that seems kind of um counterintuitive does doesn't it yes <laughs> if you build it into a system is it any longer serendipity yeah yeah it's That's uh, deep <laughs> that is deep that is deep yeah. all right can you even believe that story about his great-grandmother who knew meanwhile shaman drum is now a little italian street food restaurant if you ever come back to town it's called piata 
Please visit michigantoday.umich.edu for more stories and podcasts. You can find Listen in Michigan under the Topics tab. Just scroll down to Podcast. We also can be found at iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Google Play Music. Okay, thanks for listening. I hope to have you back next month. Until then, as always, Go Blue! Go Blue!